dear guests and participants, thank you for being on time. I appreciate your attention. We are going to begin our first session on the program. And before giving the word to our moderator and before presenting him, we are going to um, announce some people asked us um, because maybe you have some people at home, at your organizations, where they can follow the program, they can follow it. Um, it's being streamed on iadlr.org. So if you want to send that information to people, you can um, watch the streaming on that location, our website. Uh, we would like to take the, each part of the session to acknowledge the presence of a group of people each time we come here to begin a session. Um, we had the presence of the Minister of Justice, the Kalnust Gulbenkian Foundation. From the United Nations, we have Professor Dr. Nazila Ganea, the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Religion and Belief, and Dr. Ibrahim Salama, the Director of the Treaties Branch of the Human Rights Council. Thank you so much for being with us. From the Religious Liberty Commission, Dr. Fernando Soares Loja, who is in fact Vice President and also the moderator for the first session, and I would appreciate that in the name of IDLR you could send our best to our dear Mr. President Vera Jardim and that he, he can recover fully and, and as quickly as possible too. From the High Commission for Migrations, I would like to highlight the presence tomorrow of Dr. Sonia Pereira, the High Commissioner for Migrations, but we have today Dr. Fernando Neves, who is the Director of the Department of Integration and Valorization of Diversity, Dr. Fernando, não se importa de fazer um sinal para que todos o conheçam. Thank you so much. Dr. Cristina Costa Gomes, coordinator of the Interreligious Dialogue Working Group. Dr. Cristina, thank you so much. I will be presenting the groups in, at the beginning of, of each session. Thank you all for your attention. I will give the word to Dr. Charles Loja. Thank you for moderating the, the first session. Thank you very much. Well, we have here a panel of three distinguished guests and uh, we are eager to learn from them. Uh, the first uh, uh, speaker is uh, Professor Nazila Ganya, uh, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief. Uh, professor Nazila Ganya is Professor of International Human Rights Law and um, Though her nearly 30 years, 30 year career has been rooted in academia, uh, Professor Ganya's academic work has often connected with multicultural uh, practices and in it international human rights law. She has contributed actively to networks interested in freedom of religion or belief and its interrelationship with other human rights and advised uh, states and other stakeholders. Professor Ganya's work as a United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief is focused on freedom of religion or belief based on the standards of the international law concerning human rights and addresses the right of everybody to hold their own religion or belief, to change their beliefs and to be able to manifest and share their beliefs. According to her own words, her goal is to support this independence, to keep the mandate impartial, focused on its main objectives so that it can strengthen our resolve to end discrimination based on religion or belief of belief and freedom of religion or belief for everybody. Professor Genia, you are very welcome to Portugal. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you for the kind invitation. And thank you, Mr. Moderator, for your kind words. I'm sure you got the dates wrong, though. Surely I haven't been working here in 30 years. Uh, I can't be that old, but <laughs> I'll go back and think about it later. 
Um, I've been given around 40 minutes, but I'll try to keep it shorter than that so that we can also have the opportunity for an exchange. I know I'm speaking to a room of experts, but what I hope to do um, in the time we have in front of us is, you know, knowing that this is the first session, I, I want to put out a sort of a template of the standards and mechanisms that we have available to us. I know the previous session also indicated some of that, but um, as a mandate holder, I thought it would be useful to recap and remind us of some of those standards, because I know that the subsequent sessions will go into more detail and give more focused attention to that. So I will um, paint a picture of some of the responsibilities of the mandate and then also an overview of the mechanisms that we have, because indeed, at least the standards do go back um, on this topic for about 30 years. And perhaps that's where the dates came from and my involvement also came from. We all know and we're all here because we are committed to the freedom of thought, conscience, religion or belief as a foundational human right. Some of us also supplement that with an ethical commitment, a religious commitment and a moral commitment. So that can reinforce uh, what is otherwise a, a legal standard and a normative standard. We all agree that it is the freedom for everyone to believe and to live their lives according to that belief. And we recognize that this is upheld um, in the normative and legal sense in many um, international and regional standards. Uh, in a slightly tongue-in-cheek way, in the forthcoming report, my first report, which will be to the Human Rights Council, I um, critique the allegation that human rights is Western, and I say, well, if we're looking at it in terms of inspiration and the historic building blocks that led us to the UN human rights standards, one could easily also claim that they are Eastern in origin. Why not? So, you know, in terms of impulse and inspiration, they do uh, draw from many civilizations and even the drafters of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights did come from different backgrounds. So the fact that freedom of religion or belief is repeated in many constitutions, in many regional systems, and uh, in many standards um, also speaks to its universality. We know that it is upheld in Article 18, uh, the freedom of thought, conscience, religion, or belief, is upheld in Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and also in the same Article 18 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. I was very disturbed recently to hear that in some regions of the world, the fact that these standards talk about thought, conscience, religion, or belief has led to some states saying that, oh, we will uphold freedom of religion, but not belief. But it is very clear from the travaux, from everything <laughs> that has been written about these standards and our understanding over the decades, that it's not that the state is invited to make a choice between thought, conscience, religion, and belief. The word or means to include that, you know, one cannot deny the protection of Article 18 because one doesn't recognize the claimants as holding a religion. The fact that they have a conscience, which of course can come from a religious inspiration and commitment or not, or an ethical commitment or a humanist commitment, of course that is what meant, is meant by belief. But it just warns us that we need to be very careful in reiterating these standards that may be more than 70 years old, but perhaps intentional misunderstandings sometimes creep into um, some regional understandings and we need to re reinstate and reiterate what is meant by these standards. Because otherwise the governments and regions will be uh, you know, claiming that they are compliant and they will be deviating from the standards that we have developed. Um, the role of the UN Special Rapporteur, of course, is to uphold this freedom. Um, the mandate has a legal and normative imperative to which the international community has given sustained attention since the founding of the United Nations and indeed before. 
Um, this freedom is not the subject matter of a standalone legal treaty, but it carries the weight of that protection, I would argue, when we consider the numerous binding and compelling standards that uphold this freedom at every level, along with the clarification that has come in the jurisprudence. We have had, for example, just from this region, from the European uh, Court of Human Rights, more than 100 judgments addressing freedom of religion or belief. We have not had enough, um, you know, other regions of the world with courts have not had so much jurisprudence, and I would like to see that become more active in the years ahead. But we also have, next month will be 37 years since this mandate has existed. So the mandate practice is also a consideration in terms of the commitment um, of freedom of religion or belief. Now, let's go back and let's remind ourselves that in 1946, the UN Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, identified the prevention of discrimination on grounds of race, sex, language, or religion, and the protection of minorities as two of the four areas of focus for the Commission on Human Rights. What was the Commission on Human Rights? It was the predecessor of the UN Human Rights Council, and it was the foremost, foremost international body to advance human rights. So two of its four um, areas of focus related to our topic here today. It related to non-discrimination and the protection of minorities. We have that protection on minorities, of course, strengthened in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, where in Article 27 it says that religious minorities should, uh, as well as others, but this is my focus, religious minorities should be able to enjoy their own culture, to profess and practice their own religion, or to use their own language. Then we had uh, a special rapporteur of the Subcommission on the Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities, Arkot Krishnaswamy, who had a, 19, uh, had a study of discrimination in matter of religious rights and practices and this study was produced in 1960. Um, at that time, we didn't have the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but already he recognizes the parameters that still guide us today. So purely on the basis of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, he outlines the importance of Article 18 and 29 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and that, manifest, uh, and that limitations to manifestation of religion or belief is only legitimate if enforced solely for one or several of the purposes mentioned in Article 29 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. What are those? They are for the purpose of meeting the just requirements of morality, public order, and the general welfare in a democratic society. He emphasizes that this holds not only the acts of the executive and of the subordinates, uh, sorry, this relates not only to the acts of the executive and subordinate government authorities, but the law itself should not violate um, manifestation of freedom of religion or belief other than in relation to these limitations. Um, and he stresses that the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion has a distinctive character. And he says that this is because of the demands of various religions and beliefs on their followers, and that these are not identical. And he recognizes that this protection of freedom of religion or belief um, can only be limited if it runs counter to the common good of society without any arbitrary judgment being exercised. So no discrimination in terms of limitations to freedom of religion or belief and the importance of strict adherence to the limitations regime when a government is restricting manifestation of freedom of religion or belief. He already foresaw this in 1960 and we still need to be reminded about it. Then what was it that what was the impulse behind the creation of the 1981 Declaration on the Elimination of Discrimination um, on Religion or Belief? And what was the 
trigger that later on led to the creation of the mandate uh, 37 years ago? Well, interestingly enough, it was events that exactly relate to freedom of religion or belief and freedom of expression. So it was in 1962 that the UN General Assembly was deeply disturbed by the manifestations of discrimination based on differences of race, color, and religion, I'm quoting, still in evidence throughout the world. Um, actually, these were primarily riots in Europe uh, that were occurring in 1962. And for this reason, the UN General Assembly asked that there should be two conventions drawn up on the elimination of racial discrimination and religious intolerance. So religion and expression, religion or belief and expression are, are critical in the very founding of a number of the mechanisms we have today. Um, so the General Assembly, um, the drafting process begins. It is recognized that the, the drafting of an instrument on religious intolerance is proving more tricky and more contentious. So the focus shifts to first drafting an instrument focused on racial intolerance. And by 1965, we have the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination that was adopted by the General Assembly. And it took many more years. It took until 1981, until a declaration was adopted on the elimination of all forms of intolerance and of discrimination based on religion or belief. Um, it took two decades to come to this short declaration of eight articles, and this speaks to the politicization and contestations around drafting an instrument addressing religious intolerance. Um, because there was no treaty in sight, in 1986, then the UN Commission on Human Rights decides to appoint a UN Special Rapporteur. It was first called a UN Special Rapporteur on Religious Intolerance, and at the request and suggestion of Professor Abdul Fattah Amor, and I met several of you who know him well, uh, knew him well, the late Professor Abdul Fattah Amor, but it was at his request in the year 2000 that the name of the mandate was changed to Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief. Did you know that this mandate was the sixth mandate thematic mandate ever created by the United Nations. Two of those six mandates no longer exist, so it's of the four longest standing mandates of the United Nations system. So perhaps this illustrates something of the importance that is given to this human rights concern, but also to the scale of the challenge that still haunts us today. Even in March 2022, when the Human Rights Council renews this mandate for another three years, that was um, in Resolution 49.5, we can recognize its attention to freedom of expression and freedom of religion or belief. It expresses deep concern at emerging obstacles to the en enjoyment of this right, it urges states to take appropriate action to promote mutual understanding through education and dialogue. It expresses concern at acts of violence, the rise of religious extremism, incidents of religious hatred, discrimination, intolerance, and violence, um, manifested through derogatory stereotyping, negative profiling, and the stigmatization of individuals on the basis of religion or belief, attacks on religious places and sites, and the vandalism of cemeteries, all of these being illustrative of freedom of expression and freedom of religion or belief. In recognizing the mandate and also giving attention to that resolution, I think we can identify three areas, three aspects to the work of freedom of religion or belief and this mandate. One is more narrowly, freedom of religion or belief as we see in Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. We've all memorized this, you know, the right to have, adopt, change religion or belief and the right to manifest it not only alone but in with others and in public um, and, and, you know, its manifestation. So this is the narrower, let's say the inner circle, if you like, 
of freedom of religion or belief? Well, maybe not the inner circle, because another dimension of the work is to address all intolerance, uh, sorry, all discrimination on the basis of religion or belief. So I don't know, should that be the inner circle or is it part of that circle? I, I, I haven't you know, thought about how it fits together exactly, except to recognize that, of course, non-discrimination on the basis of religion or belief is also critical. Now, a third aspect that I think the resolution and its illustrations also um, you know, support is the targeting of um, individuals based on or in the name of religion or belief. So, you know, this relates to um, other rights and also relates to everyone, regardless of whether they are claiming their Article 18 rights, yes? Yeah? So, what the mandate has used, and, and, you know, I can refer to many mandate holders, is that the emphasis is on saying in the name of religion or belief. We are not theologians, or even if we were theologians, like Professor Bielefeld in fact was, we are not working in that theological capacity. Okay, so this is a human rights capacity and mandate. Therefore, I think it's only proper that we say in the name of religion or belief. It's for others to ponder and to um, you know, distill and to discuss theologically whether it is actually you know, a religious motivation behind it or not. For human rights purposes, what matters is that it, this, this violation or this restriction or this discrimination is being called for in the name of religion or belief. Um, and you know, this, of course, can lead to discrimination, hostility, violence, and violating the rights of others. So all of these dimensions are important. What we see over development, especially over the last 10 years, is that we shouldn't only look at this negative of violations in the name of the religion or belief, because there are also responses and calls for <coughs> elevation, Christina has advised me, is in the literature, elevation in the name of religion or belief. So, you know, religion or belief need not only be a call for restricting, it can be a call for not only respecting human rights, but also going beyond human rights standards. So in terms of this positive dimension, I think we'll hear from Dr. Ibrahim Salama about one, one of the responses is um, faith for rights and uh, the Beirut Declaration. Uh, there's also the, the Fez Plan of Action that recognizes that in fact religious leaders can play a positive role. So let's not only say that religion or belief is called for in the human rights sphere for violations, it certainly is sadly. And if you look at the preamble of the 1981 declaration, it gives a long history of all the calamities that have been perpetuated and suffered in the name of religion or belief in the past. So we can't deny that. But you know, th there is also the positive dimension that religion or belief can strengthen respect for human rights. And I would even say supersedes mere legal standards to calling for a, a higher standard. Now, what do we see in terms of the communications that come to the mandate? And by communications, I mean, the, the term that is used is allegation letters. So, you know, if you, with all the rich experiences that you have and the engagements you have at the grassroots, see a violation of freedom of religion or belief, there's a simple web page, there's an email you can send in, um, what at that point is called an allegation letter, because you know the mandate doesn't go to investigate legally, independently, at the grassroots, to confirm or not exactly what is happening. So it's an allegation. Um, I prefer the term communication. So you report it, and the mandate does a quick fact check. It also ensures that there is the permission of the victims in order to pursue this. It also details the legal grounds of what may be violations that are being experienced, and it sends that on behalf of the victims and the intermediaries to the government concerned, and says, we have heard reports of this, this, and this, this date, this, these incidents. They would seem to be in violation of all of these commitments that you have. Please may you respond. At that point, it is not made public, the state concerned is given 60 days to respond. Um, and then all of this is public, if you know where to look, on the UN website in terms of communications. 
So what is the mandate seeing in terms of this area of freedom of expression and freedom of religion or belief? Uh, I think we all agree that, and the previous uh, panel spoke to this, that these rights should be mutually reinforcing, um, that you know, expression is also crucial to freedom of religion or belief itself, and, and that you know, we, sh we should really operationalize and be committed to these rights being inalienable, indivisible, interdependent, and interrelated. But um, what has come to, what comes to the mandate? Well, serious violations continue, as we all know from looking around us. Um, and in 2019, my predecessor, Professor Ahmad Shahid, estimated that around 58% of the previous 665 communications that had come to the mandate, that is between 2004 and 2019, 58% of them addressed violations of freedom of expression and freedom of religion or belief. So, you know, this field has been, I've argued, it triggered the 1962 resolution. It has been evident in, you know, from the 40s onwards, and it continues to be experienced as, as quite a, a, a dominant burden or call for assistance from the mandate. What are some of the ones that we have sent out in the last six months that I have been in this mandate. They have included the fatwa issued by the former Iranian head of state against the author Salman Rushdie and the publishers of his book, The Satanic Verses, calling for the killing, uh, his killing on the basis of blasphemy. Does, is anybody surprised that this should be a concern of this mandate? No? Okay, good. Because I want to be quite strict about which communications the mandate carries. There is sort of something of a solidarity of supporting each other amongst the mandate holders, but I think I need to stick to the parameters of the instruction I have, if you like. So clearly this is the third of the dimensions, right? It's uh, violations in the name of religion or belief. Another, the detention, sentencing, and ill treatment of a particular religious minority following their participation in peaceful protests and in relation to their human rights and media work. Is that clear, clearly, squarely, in relation to this mandate and this topic? Arbitrary arrest and administrative sanctions against Protestants in Vietnam for having celebrated a UN day. And which UN day? The 22nd of August International Day commemorating the victims of acts of violence based on religion or belief. They were gathering in a home amongst themselves to mark this day, and they were arrested and sanctioned. We're all convinced it relates, okay? The prosecution of an atheist in the Maldives for attempting to disrupt, allegedly, to disrupt religious unity by expressing his belief through social media. And then the receipt of death threats by him, by others. Increasing patterns of gender-based violence online in India, where the perpetrators uh, did many things, but amongst the, uh, the actions was the auctioning of Indian Muslim women and the discussion of fantasies about sexual violence against them. The prosecution of a Christian pa pastor in Nepal for allegedly having outraged religious feelings of other communities by peacefully practicing and preaching his religion or belief. This violated national laws that prohibited proselytism. And the conviction of two individuals in Somaliland due to their conversion to Christianity. And as a result of that, they had committed blasphemy, they had insulted the state religion because of their membership uh, and because they declared that they had become Christians on a Christian group on Facebook. So this is only a selection. This is not the fully representative. But I want to just, um, from this very small and unrepresentative sample, <laughs> what we can gather is that the hype around this so-called conflict between freedom of religion or belief and freedom of expression hangs on extreme scenarios in which religion or belief 
incites and perpetuates violence and attacks, or where religion or belief demonizes and dehumanizes, or where expression makes religion and religiosity impossible. Um, so for example, that any perceived criticism purely extinguishes the possibility of sacredness and religious belonging. These are quite extreme examples. I'm not saying they don't happen. Unfortunately, they do. But, and, and of course, I know that the, the more extreme examples won't come as a communication to the special rapporteur because we are talking about, you know, a, um, the beginning of a civil war or a conflict or, or something that is going to implode in a society. But nevertheless, I want to suggest that when we are looking at many of the instances of violations, um, they don't really touch upon this, the extremities uh, that are being claimed. What we see from the communications um, are, in fact, a death threat raised by a head of state, detention and ill treatment of a religious minority, the arrest and sanctioning of a religious minority for peacefully gathering, state prosecution due to expression of belief through social media, no state protection following despite death threats, the lack of state um, protection against gender-based sexual violence against women belonging to a religious minority, the prosecution of a religious leader for peaceful practice and teaching, <coughs> and conviction resulting from conversion because it is alleged that mere conversion insults state religion and blasphemy. But actually, it's because of their belonging and having changed their religion or belief. So these charges of blasphemy and apostasy are camouflaging violence. Um, and, uh, and what we are seeing is that, you know, it says blasphemy or apostasy, but actually it is, it is the state itself that is f failing in its duty to protect and to respect human rights, regardless of any, you know, without any bias on the basis of religion or belief. So, you know, we need to be cautious that we are not legitimizing state-driven or endorsed violations of human rights and <coughs> aggravating discrimination against religious or belief minorities in the name of protecting uh, freedom of religion or belief from freedom of ex expression. Is that clear? You know, from this sample, you know, the, state, the states since 1999 at the UN until the Rabat Plan of Action were calling upon more instruments against uh, freedom of expression, but we mustn't be blind to the risk that they will use it to violate religious minorities more, to discriminate on the basis of religious, uh, religion or belief more, and for failing due process, equality before the law, uh, and equality. So the legal framework that we have and have developed for freedom of expression and freedom of religion or belief, and with this I will end, uh, are diverse. I would suggest that when it comes to incitement, we turn to Article 20 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but also Resolution 1618 and the Rabat Plan of Action. If we are experiencing or there's the risk of atrocity crimes, then we have the instruments and the development of the FES Plan of Action, and its plus five outcome document. If there is the experience, the actual experience, rather than the hype or the, you know, uh, the, yes, the hype. If, we are, uh, if there is violence and discrimination, then we have the limitation regime of Article 18, but also Article 19. For apostasy, we must turn to Article 18.2 and Article 18.3 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, for blasphemy, we must turn to um, General Comment 34 of the UN Human Rights Committee. And for positive opportunities, we have the Faith for Rights and Beirut Declaration, also FES Plan of Action. And for all of these concerns, we must remind ourselves of Article 5 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and Article 18.2. Um, let me just turn to them. 
Article 18.2 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights says that no one shall be subject to coercion, which would impair his freedom to have or to adopt a religion or belief of his choice. So we mustn't inadvertently be assisting coercion or to be extinguishing the possibility of people to adopt, have, and change a religion or belief of their choice. And in all of this, we need to be mindful of Article 5.1 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, that nothing, no right, can be interpreted as implying for any state, group, or person any right uh, to perform, to engage in any activity or perform any act aimed at the destruction of any of the rights and freedoms recognized in human rights, okay? So we cannot use freedom of expression to extinguish freedom of religion or belief, and we cannot use freedom of religion or belief in order to destroy, to e extinguish freedom of expression. So we have many tools and mechanisms, and before we try to reinvent the wheel and start a new normative instrument, we should at least have been exhausted these and applied to them uh, carefully uh, and consistently at the grassroots. Now, um, they, the organizers asked me to briefly address some of the work of the mandate. Um, we all know that the mandates work through communications, reporting thematically, and country visits. Um, the mandate is deeply reliant on the work of stakeholders and civil society in being able to carry out its responsibilities. And um, over the last five, six months, um, I've been fortunate enough to join 25 public events, around 10 trainings. I've met dozens of stakeholders in many parts of the world um, and had a number of academic visits, including this one. There have been 23 communications in the first four and a half months of the mandate, um, and they have addressed you know, countries from Asia to, uh, to Africa to, and beyond. I've also joined 13 statements by other mandate holders, and I've requested country visits to Brazil, Egypt, Indonesia, Nigeria, Mauritius, and Tajikistan, and so far the last two have actually <laughs> progressed to giving me a date for such a country visit. Um, it'll be interesting to know that the mandate over the last 37 years has visited 45 countries. And I'm very mindful of the geographic spread and diversity of those 45 in order to try and address gaps and uh, try to give attention to parts of the world that have not been addressed through country reports by the mandate before. In the forthcoming report next month, um, I look at the landscape of freedom of religion and belief, and that's the report to the Human Rights Council to recognize that this field is very different to how it looked 10 years ago. I know the experience of, your, um, of this movement and this group stretches back to the late 1800s, you said, 1893, you said. So, you know, that's a long history, but I'm sure you would also have witnessed that we have many more actors working under the umbrella of freedom of religion or belief, development, humanitarian work, human rights work, peace building. So, you know, let's, let's look at where we are at. And, you know, I have to be concerned about what that means, about what can be the value added of the meager resources of this mandate. Um, in the subsequent reports, I want to open up the debate more to, you know, we, we all observe violations by the state. And, you know, calling out those violations and recognizing them and calling on the state to respect its obligations is, is hugely important. It will not go away. But when we are experiencing discrimination and tolerance uh, on the basis of religion or belief in a particular place at a particular time, there are many authorities that are impactful in either respect or violations of human rights from the government, but also from wider society. So planning permission, parliamentarians, municipal organizations, um, national human rights institute, uh, institutions, human rights organizations uh, and religious leaders and communi communities can all shape and impact the experience of violations or respect of freedom of religion or belief. So I try to acknowledge that in the General Assembly report to say that, you know, there are many other authorities that can play a role here and do play a role, whether for the positive or negative. So I hope that gives a glimpse of, of the mandate. And I'm happy to take any questions if there's time. Thank you.
thank you so much for your wonderful uh, presentation. And, and we would take uh, some questions if you wish to address um, uh, this, the, the, what we have heard here, if you want to address directly. Okay. Do we? Yes, please. Uh. No. And, and Nancy, let's ask a quick question about uh, this certain point of your presentation that was very interesting. You mentioned something about uh, emphasizing only the negative aspects of uh, religion and freedom of religion. I know that the work of, of uh, the, the special rapporteur is mostly about violation, right, um, a radiography of what is going wrong in our societies. Now, the problem with freedom of religion is that I would say it's, a, it's more or less a special fundamental right in the sense that it has definite protagonists, main actors, in the name of religious communities, churches. And uh, if, in, if you transmit by those reports those lots of violations that sometimes the targets of the violations have religious communities, but other times the responsible for the violation are religious communities themselves, be it of freedom of religion or other fundamental rights, you may inadvertently transmit the idea that religion is a sort of nuisance to mankind. It's a sort of a swarm of horse flies that uh, they, mankind would work much better without them. And therefore, whenever you provide stronger support for freedom of religion, you are giving more space to the swarm of horseflies. So is there any way that in the mandates like yours, uh, we cannot, we, because some people are actually interested in, in transmitting, in disseminating this wrong, partial, biased view of religion. Is there any way you can do something about that in your mandate? Thanks. Um, I, I think that's uh, excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, I've tried to reflect that by saying, okay, there are these three aspects of the mandate, and then in the third aspect, that is violations in the name of religion or belief, to also say, you know, effectively inspiration from religion or belief. So I think I have, thankfully, you know, you, you have to go with your mandate, and you can't uh, depart from it drastically. But in the illustrations in the resolution, um, that renewed the mandates last March. There are examples, you know, it calls for training and dialogue and interfaith and intercultural dialogue. So they, they, don't, they don't state it as the positive contribution of religion or belief, but I have inferred from that the positive contribution of religion or belief. Now, when it comes to communications, many of the, you know, it's a human rights framework. Some of the communications are coming through the special rapporteur on prohibition of torture or extrajudicial killings or um, the working group for discrimination against women and girls. So, you know, there are many examples coming that are in relation to violations in the name of religion or belief. And I think uh, for those who are, you know, active and committed to their religion or belief, I don't think we should see a problem with calling out violations in the name of religion or belief, because in any case, in the vast majority of situations, they are perpetuated by the state in the name of religion or belief. Or even if they are not, the state is not complying with its human rights obligations by stopping it or responding to it or ensuring that justice is, uh, you know, there's due process and there is justice. So I don't feel that there should be a conflict between recognizing the violations in the name of religion or belief. In fact, maybe it liberates religion or belief to be what it is. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there might be a divergence of views on that. But with the communications, I am mindful to try and hit all of these three aspects, but I can't play with it. You know, I'm not the one who says, you know, please, can you go and make sure that there is a communication that also draws from the positive examples of faith communities. But in this landscaping paper, I recognize all the positives um, that also you know, have really, very briefly, because 10,000 words in the end is very little, especially when you've put in all the essential UN requirements, then it becomes about 8,000 words, etc. But I have tried to at least footnote many examples and, uh, of the positives. But 
it is the human rights framework, so I, I, you know, I have to also reflect what comes to the mandate. Any suggestions you have about how I can do that more is, is, is very welcome. But I will be mindful of it in country visits and in thematic reports without diluting or not addressing violations in the name of religion belief <coughs> alongside that. But I think the first dimension is very, you know, sorry, I think there is the risk of this mandate getting really overcome with violations in the name of religion or belief and forgetting freedom of religion or belief it's itself. So, you know, in all the communications I join with other mandate holders, they are rarely actually upholding freedom of religion or belief in the narrow Article 18 sense. They are either discrimination or they are violations in the name of religion or belief. So I need to put some emphasis on that first one because nobody else will really be doing it. And I can call on the special rapporteur on minority issues to join me, sometimes one or two others, but that becomes the more kind of, it, it has to remain in the mandate, otherwise nobody else will do it. Thank you so much. Uh, we can just have just one brief question, please. Very quickly, uh, Nazira, uh, I think it's very lucid, your reference to Article 5. I myself who work with these articles all the time, I didn't notice it is reconciliatory uh, potential in terms of tensions between rights. And I think this is a taboo uh, and an elephant in the room of the human rights architecture, the issue of tensions between rights. Do you see as a future potential that maybe a general comment or a collab collaborative work between you and human rights committee on the potential, I mean, the, a, contra a contrary notion, not using rights against rights, but the positive reading of it is the necessity of optimizing rights together. And the different techniques to do this, focusing on freedom of religion, because it's the most flagrant in terms of its potential tensions with other rights, particularly freedom of religion. Is there a potential work to do? Is there a missing, probably, general comment or some joint action between you and the relevant rapporteur? Thank you. Um, I, I haven't. I haven't thought about that, and I think that uh, it's <coughs> worth giving more attention to. Um, I think it's important to bring in Article 5 uh, more. Uh, but, you know, the current, um, the general comment we have on Article 18 is um, 30 years old this year. It's still really valid, and we still fall short in <laughs> addressing it. And I keep coming across this, that it came to the, the UPR of two countries, Universal Periodic Review of con two countries, and one looks back four and a half years and thinks all the recommendations from four and a half years ago have only got worse and none of them have been advanced. You look at the general comment 22 on article 18 from 30 years ago, there's still a lot of mileage in it. Um, you look at um, one of the countries I'm visiting, the last time it was visited 26 years ago. Um, some of the victim groups were just last night were saying, those recommendations from 26 years ago still valid. In another example, yeah. I was looking at recommendations from 1995 from Professor Amor, actually, from a country visit. Still a lot of mileage in them. So sadly, I mean, there is still mileage in what we have, but we can acknowledge more of, the, the, um, of what you suggest in a new general comment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor <coughs> Nazila Kania, for your uh, brilliant uh, presentation and your answers. And we are moving on, and next uh, lecturer is uh, Professor Jonatas Machado. He is the Dean of the Faculty of Law in Coimbra. Uh, he has been Professor of International Law, European Union Law, Constitutional Law, and Tax Law. Uh, I think I didn't miss anything. But uh, in recent years, he has served as Executive Director of the Jus Gentium Conimigre Conimbrige Center for Human Rights. He is part of the list of conciliators of the conciliation body of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. He has uh, published several books, some of them landmarks in our country, and scientific articles on different themes of constitutional law, tax law, international law, and European Union law. He is also a member of the Honorary Committee of the International uh, Association for the Defense of Religious Liberty. So we welcome you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much.
thank you very much, um, Dr. Fernando Loja. Uh, in you and through you, let me greet all the participants and of this event. And a special word to Reverend Paulo Macedo, uh, and uh, thanks for his kind invitation. So um, <clears throat> I will bring here the, the topic of uh, freedom of expression and religious communities in polarized societies, in ideologically polarized societies. Um, <clears throat> let me start uh, with um, Karl Popper. Karl Popper, uh, as you know, was a, a Jewish philosopher from you know, the beginning of the 20th century. He, he lived in Vienna, and he was close to the Vienna Kreis of uh, philosophers, but not, not that much. And uh, he was concerned with, uh, with the situation of his time, you know, the fascism on the rise, communism on the rise, and he was worried about the, the uh, authoritarianism and eventually he saw also Nazism flourish in Germany. And then he moved to, to England, to Cambridge, where he, he had a strange fight with another Jewish philosopher, Ludwig Wittgenstein. And, they, and Ludwig Wittgenstein actually um, held a, a poker, you know, a, a, a metal rod used to steer up fire. And he tried to hit uh, Karl Popper with this poker as they were discussing, because Ludwig Wittgenstein, he saw philosophy as a discussion about the meaning of words, uh, propositions. And Karl Popper, he saw philosophy uh, as a way of building a democratic society, a free society, an open society. So we thought that philosophers had, had this social responsibility of contributing to create uh, free society, and so he denounced he denounced the the works of other philosophers whom he called uh, authoritarian philosophers such as Plato, Hegel, and Marx, because they were deterministic, uh, they they were totalitarian, and uh, he, he defended the open society, and he had this commitment to individual freedom the critical debate of ideas, the critical exchange of ideas, and uh, the openness and indetermination of society. And I, I, I must say that he had this commitment to truth, but uh, he, he thought that we, we would attain truth by falsifying, uh, you know, uh, different propositions. So, you know, contrary to some religious uh, groups that think that they have already the truth that is already defined. He said, no, we, we attain truth by, by falsifying, uh, by showing that some propositions are false. Uh, and from falsify, uh, falsification to falsification, we get closer to the truth. So he thought that the, the, the critical process uh, in society should be open to you know, to conjectures and refutations, trials and errors. And so, uh, in, in a way, we all, uh, our, uh, our own beliefs should be subject to this uh, conjecture and refutation, you know, sh should, this, should be subject to this permanent critical engagement in society. So, um, I think it's a good start. Of course, I, I, I hope that you, you understand that in 30 minutes, I have to oversimplify uh, everything I say. I know things are very much nuanced, but uh, I, I will have to, to oversimplify, of course. Um, I, I will skip this, this article because Professor Nazila already uh, spoke about uh, the human rights framework, and we are all familiar with this. But I will let me uh, explain what I mean by ideologically divided societies. Uh, ideologically divided societies or polarized societies are societies in which uh, we find uh, um, different philosophical foundations. You know, for instance, um, during Christendom, 
in Europe, uh, we had only a Christian foundation. Uh, and then after the Protestant Reformation, we had different, uh, different uh, uh, opinions, different flavors of Christianity, but still there was uh, a dominant Christ uh, Christian worldview. But now uh, we have different uh, worldviews. We have positivism, uh, materialism, existentialism, utilitarianism, pragmatism, postmodernism, critical theories. This means that the, the days in which there was an agreed upon f Christian mindset uh, are gone. Uh, and so this means that societies become more and more complex and there are uh, fundamental disagreements in, in our societies. Such a, in issues such as the origin, meaning, and destiny of life. You know, people disagree about these subjects. You know, there is no consensus, uh, many opinions uh, over these topics. Human nature and social values. You know, what is human nature? What is, what is a man? What is a woman? What, what, is, uh, what is sex? What is gender? You know, uh, um, what is human nature? You know, we speak of human rights, but there is no, no, not a consensus about what is human and about what are rights. Uh, and so this is problematic. Um, the, the, the foundation, content, and limits of human rights. You know, uh, I work in human rights, and I must admit that it, it is becoming a very difficult place to be because... Uh, um, it, it's not obvious w uh, what we mean when we uh, we speak about, uh, you know, for instance, the, the privacy. What is privacy? What what does this uh, encompass? Uh, what what is uh, religion? What is uh, expression? What is conscience? Uh, what is uh, family? It's very complicated, uh, you know. Uh, lots of uh, discussions, lots of debates, and it seems that there is no objective truth, objective standards. So it becomes your opinion against my opinion, uh, and it's problematic. Uh, the harmonization of community stability with individual freedom. You know, how can you, you, how can you protect individuals without becoming individualistic? Uh, how can uh, you protect collective interests without becoming collectivistic? You know, so uh, how, wh what, are the, what is the Pareto optimal position uh, on this issue? So these are, uh, these are very sensitive. And, and, uh, and, and uh, another point that uh, has been studied also in, in some scholarship, is the idea that sometimes societies can be so ideologically divided that uh, 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 even if there is an external enemy, uh, because, you know, so, sometimes there was this idea, uh, Freud find, you know, enemy, eh, 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 um, uh, friend and, and foe, friend and foe distinction, uh, and societies sometimes... Uh, try to come together when they, they, they had this external enemy. But now, even with the external enemy, uh, they don't come together anymore because the external enemy now is an, a, a friend of one of the, of the factions, uh, of the ideological factions. So the, the external enemy uh, is uh, looked upon by some sectors as, uh, as the, the friend that comes uh, to save us from our internal enemies. Uh, and, and so this, this is a phenomenon that is being studied, and it shows that uh, uh, we live really in uh, ideologically divided societies. And we see this in the United States, we see this in Brazil, we see this in Europe, even in Europe, for instance, when we speak of uh, some countries like Hungary and things like that, you know, we see that uh, Russia is probably the, the friend that, uh, and not so much the enemy. Uh, uh, so we, we see, that, you know, this is complicated, I, I admit. And um, I, 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 I hope that you do justice to, uh, you know, to, uh, 
acknowledge that I know that this is nuanced, is complicated, but I, I'm simplifying this here. Uh, and now we have this uh, freedom of expression. What, what can we expect from freedom of expression in uh, ideologically divided societies? You know, the origins of uh, freedom of expression can be seen in John Milton, John Stuart Mill, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Karl Popper, and, and things like that. We have this uh, United Nations framework. We know that the, it has a subjective and objective dimension, a wide regulatory and protection scope, uh, the idea of uh, pro prohibition of censorship, uh, uh, strict restrictions regime, and this idea of trying to come up with um, with the solutions uh, of uh, when there are conflicts of rights so that uh, uh, allow for practical concordance, social integration, uh, and maximum effectiveness of, as tools to solve conflicts of rights. Of course, I know that this is easier said than done. You know, we in constitutional law we have this uh, these principles that allow us try to allow us to sort out conflicts of rights uh, and come up with a, a balancing solution. But uh, it's not easy, and it's becoming difficult by the day. Uh, <clears throat> let me quote, uh, uh, let me quote uh, the European Court of Human Rights in a very famous case. You know, this, this uh, segment here, uh, um, in which they, they uh, implicitly acknowledge that there is this dialectical tension between uh, rights uh, in, you know, in polarized and divided societies. Freedom of expression not only applies to information or ideas that are welcomed or considered harmless or indifferent, but encompasses ideas that offend, shock, or disturb the state or any sector of the population. So, so you know, this, this uh, means that uh, freedom of expression will not necessarily bring peace and concordance uh, uh, to, to, the, to the world, but sometimes dialectical tension, sometimes real ide ideolo uh, ideological conflict. And, he, 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 and nobody said it was easy, you know. Uh, so it, 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 is, it is not easy to, to deal with this tension. Um, another judge from uh, the UK uh, in a very famous uh, case, uh, he, he said, uh, Lord Justice Sedley, he, he said, uh, freedom of expression includes not only the harmless, but the irritating, the contentious, the eccentric, the erratical, the unwanted, and the provocative, as long as it is, does not tend to provoke violence. It's not worth having freedom just to speak armlessly. From Socrates' condemnation to the persecution of contemporary writers and journalists, our world has seen many examples of state control of unofficial ideas. So another, another acknowledgment that um, you know, freedom of expression in, in societies that don't have this common framework uh, of values uh, can be can be uh, complicated, you know. Can can be complicated. What are the substantive goals of freedom of expression? Why is it that freedom of expression is still important? Uh, <clears throat> individual autonomy. Uh, so we are uh, um, communicative. Beings, we, we like to, to create content, we like to create meaning. <coughs> so it's important for us. We, we like to speak about, uh, we, uh, to express our opinions about everything. We go to a movie, we, we, um, we speak about the movie. We go to a, a religious service, we, we speak about that. We go to school, we, we like to give our opinions on on all, uh, all matters, all different matters. So individual autonomy is important. Also the pursuit of truth and knowledge, you know, as Karl uh, Popper would say. <coughs> Sorry, the, the pursuit of uh, truth and knowledge. <coughs> Sorry, in the academy, it's important. 
democracy and the rule of law. You cannot have democracy without freedom of expression. You know, uh, it, it is not uh, enough to have to give everyone the right to vote if people cannot, uh, you know, uh, make up their minds on, on the freely on the politicians on the policies that they they are going to choose. You know, the the idea of uh, also a free marketplace of ideas, uh, this notion that. Uh, um, you know, ideas should be di disseminated from bottom up uh, in a decentralized way uh, <clears throat> without an uh, authoritarian enforcer uh, of, uh, of uh, ideas. <coughs> the let off steam, you know, the exhaust valve, you know, the idea that sometimes the pressure increases and so freedom of expression is a way of letting off steam letting people express themselves when they are frustrated, uh, when they are angry. Uh, so, uh, and also the, this peaceful transformation of society. The, the idea that when we speak together, when we know uh, <clears throat> the, the points of view of each other, we understand better the opinions of each other, where people come from, why they think what they think, and, and so, that allows for the peaceful transformation of society. And, and it, for instance, we know that uh, many centuries ago, the, the, the Protestant Reformation brought uh, many conflicts, religious conflicts between Protestants and Catholics. But, you know, a, a, a system of freedom of religion, a freedom of expression, uh, created the conditions for, for open communication and the, the the prejudices and biases fell, and, and now uh, interaction is perfectly normal and productive and friendly and cooperative. So, uh, so <clears throat> we we see that uh, uh, freedom of expression has this this uh, possibility, but of course it also has some risks. Not not everything is is uh, bright. Sometimes we have the risk of too much information, and uh, sometimes uh, an information uh, overload is, is not that good at all. It's uh, less information. Uh, and you, we have also the, the dangers of disinformation, manipulation, the dissemination of antisocial behavior, moral depravity, Resonance chambers and bubbles. This means uh, chambers where people talk to each other and they don't listen to the others who think differently anymore. They are in a bubble. They are in a social media bubble, for instance, and they don't discuss anymore. They, 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 they form these ideas uh, of the other and so they, 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 they don't talk anymore uh, with, with each other. They talk past each other. Ideological polarization. Uh, you know, many many authors claim that the social media, for instance, they have uh, they uh, they have contributed to the radicalization of societies uh, uh, in, in ways that uh, are unprecedented. Uh, and sectorism and violence. Uh, uh, we have seen, for instance, uh, we have had the cases of the you know, the invasion of the capital in the United States, and then later on the invasion, invasion of the Congress in Brazil. In Brazil. Uh, and we have this, uh, this uh, sectari sectarianism and violence. Uh, the danger uh, lurks. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> and, and there is also uh, another e effect that we see now in polarized societies, that is uh, the emperor's new clothes effect. The emperor's new clothes effect. Don't dare to talk. What, what do we all know the story of the emperor's new clothes? It is a um, uh, Hans Christian Andersen story. You know, he he, he talks about two uh, swindlers, two 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 guys that came to the to the capital of a, a given kingdom, and there was this emperor. Uh, and they tried to convince the emperor that they could produce uh, wonderful garments for the emperor uh, and, uh, 
uh, and the, the emperor would be pleased, uh, the subjects would be pleased, uh, and things like that. So they, they, uh, they acted as if they were preparing the, the, the emperor's clothes, uh, and then they acted as if they were dressing the clothes uh, to the emperor. But you know, some people were suspicious because they didn't see any clothes. But uh, the, 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 the guys, the swindlers, said, no, no, the, 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 the clothes are so pure, so, so fine, so transparent. You, you, know, you, you probably cannot see them, but they are real. They, but uh, you know, they were suspicious, but they, they, they didn't want to mm. criticize because they were afraid to being stupid, you know, looked as, as stupid, as idiots, as uh, biased in some way. So they, they didn't have the courage to speak. Be, because so th there was this idea, if you, if you speak, you, you, are, you are stupid, you are an idiot. Uh, uh, and, and so now we live in a situation in, we, in which there is this, also this effect. Uh, w when do we experience this effect? For instance, uh, when we want to address LGBT ideology, uh, it, it, it seems that you, you cannot do that. You, you can, even if you are not, not totally in agreement with, with the, the, this idea, you know, this, this, uh, of this identity politics, this idea of um, creating your idea on the basis of, your, your identity on the basis of your physical impulses, you know, you, even if you are not totally comfortable with the impact on, on the family, on children, and things like that, uh, you, you cannot touch that issue. You cannot address the issue. Uh, and gender ideology, which is different, because, um, you know, LGBT is more centered on the, the impulses of the body, Whereas gender ideology is more centered on the impulses of the mind. You know, it's forget your body. Your body is not, is not important. You are what you think you are, regardless of your body. You can deny your body. But then people say, Man, that's strange. You know, it's strange that uh, a woman would be a woman just because it feels like a woman, even the, if the body is... A, the body of a man, you know, but you cannot touch that area because he, if you do, you are stupid, you are uh, bigoted, you are prejudiced, uh, you are an idiot, or something like that. So it's a, it's a, it's a, another topic. Another topic is critical race theory. You know, if you if you if you are critical of the, uh, a system that uh, that discriminates against some ethnic groups and things like that. Oh, you, 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 you should not uh, be allowed in the universities. You should not be allowed uh, in the schools. You, you should be quiet. But then you say, yeah, but uh, the system is not fair enough. You know, there, there is this discrimination, uh, but uh, you, you don't talk about that. You, you cannot talk about that. Uh, uh, you know, don't, don't talk about that issue. Abortion, for instance, if you, uh, if you discuss the, the recent case, Dobbs versus Jackson in the United States, and, uh, uh, and if you are against abortion, you, you may get yourself in trouble. You may be attacked. Or uh, if, you, if you have a different position, if you are pro-abortion, uh, you also can uh, be threatened. Uh, and, and so th th there is th this idea, don't talk about these subjects. Uh, Zionism, for instance, if you if you criticize a, a, a policy of the government of Israel or the government of Israel, ah, you you are anti-Semite. You, you are uh, uh, so you are uh, uh, guilt of anti-Semitism. And he said, no, no, I I I, I, I am not a, a, an anti-Semite. I, I just don't agree with the, the policy of the Israeli government. Uh, but uh, so this. And uh, Islam, for instance, if you criticize, if you criticize <coughs> a genital uh, mutilation, ah, you are you are Islamophobe and things. Like, no, no, I'm not Islamophobe. I, I, I just want to criticize that that uh, specific practice. Uh, and COVID-19, for instance, if you say, oh, uh, I 
I don't agree with va vaccines. You know, I, I don't agree with this confinement. I have a different position. Even if it is, if it is well grounded in science, in, even if it is uh, put forward by respected academics, no, you cannot say that. You cannot say that because you are stupid, you are an idiot. No, I, uh, I have a PhD from Harvard or Yale. Oh no, you are stupid anyway. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> climate change, climate change. You, if you di don't agree with climate change models, uh, you, you are a conspiracy theorist or you are a climate change denier. And they said, no, no, I, I, I have a degree on this. I, I have a climatologist. I, 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 I have uh, hundreds of publications in the scientific journals. No, you are stupid. You, you cannot talk about it. Uh, and the origin of the universe and life. He, if, you are, if you have doubts about Darwin or about uh, the Big Bang or about, uh, about uh, uh, abiogenesis and things like that, oh no, you cannot say that. You, you are stupid, you are an idiot. So we have, unfortunately, many of the emperor's new clothes effect. Don't dare to talk. Don't dare to say, to speak about your opinion because if you do, you are bigoted, you are Reverse, you are wicked, you are uh, idiot, you are stupid, uh, and things like that. I'll give you some examples, some uh, real life examples. Christina Ellingson, a representative of the feminist organization of Women's Declaration International, which was subject to police investigation on charges of hate crimes in the face of Norwegian gender identity protection law, for some tweets she tweeted bef uh, between February 2021 and January 2022, directed at the man, so she tweeted, uh, directed at the man who claimed to be a lesbian woman. So the man claimed to be a lesbian woman. Uh, and she said that men cannot be lesbians. That, that was her position. Christina Ellingson will, pro will have probably been surprised by the fact that her belief that a lesbian is a woman who feels sexually attracted to another woman was considered, after all, not only naive and outdated, but above all, hateful. So uh, all she said that uh, only a woman can be a lesbian. Yeah, but that is transphobic and things like that. So uh, th this is an example. Another example. Gunther Bagley, a reputed uh, German paleontologist, worked as a curator of the State Museum of National History in Stuttgart. In 2009, he decided to organize an exhibition celebrating the 20, uh, to 250th anniversary of the publication of The Origin of the Species by Charles Darwin. Driven by his intellectual honesty, Bickley decided to read some of the creationist works. To his surprise, he failed to, uh, to accept uh, Darwinian arguments. Uh, it, was, uh, it was long enough to be, uh, it was enough to be removed from his position as curator of the museum. And uh, now he's working in the United States. He, he went as exile to the United States. Uh, he, he, he was, uh, he was a, a, an atheist Darwinian, but he, 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 he just, read some, some uh, creationist uh, books by a scientif a scientists, uh, and he was convinced by the arguments, but he was expelled uh, from his position. So, uh, Gunther Beckley. Another example. <clears throat> uh, in 2021 in, uh, 21 in the United Kingdom, an el elderly a uh, woman, and there are several cases like this, not just this one, this is just an example. Rose Laylor was arrested and fined for walking and praying a rosary in silence in front of an abortion clinic, despite meeting all the demands of wearing a mask and social distancing at COVID-19. The police considered this her prayer was not sufficient reason to justify that she had gone out on the street during the confinement, as it was, in the opinion of the, uh, uh, of the authorities, a protest. In July 22, th in the context of judicial challenge, the decision was eventually overturned and the criminal complaint was withdrawn because it was understood that Rosa Leyler's conduct was limited to the scope of protection 
uh, of the right of freedom of religion and expression. But unfortunately, there have been other cases after this one. Uh, <coughs> another example, uh, Nicholas Merriweather, a, prof a, philo a philosophy professor at Shanui, uh, Sh Shanui uh, State University in Southern Ohio, sued in the school in 2018, arguing that the disciplinary action fled, filed against him for refusing to use the female titles of uh, and pronounce preferred by a male student who identified as a woman violated his free speech rights. The school understood that the teacher had created an environment of style to a transgender student violating the school's policy of non-discrimination based on gender identity, understood as a personal self-definition of someone as male, female, or other. The professor <coughs> argued that the, the, the use of male and female pronouns should not depend solely on the subjective and arbitrary, pre, arbitrary preferences of each other, of each one, but should be based on an objective and probable uh, biological factual basis. The court held that forcing Professor Merriweather to call the students the, by the pronouns designated by him went against the religious convictions and philosophical beliefs philosophical belie beliefs of the teacher. But it's not Professor, clear that all, we, uh, the, it's not clear that all uh, cases would uh, be like this. So uh, I will skip another example. <coughs> just just to, to, uh, uh, to bring in current sen uh, censorship strategies. There are too many indeterminate concepts like phobias, prejudice, offense, hatred that are used to, to censorship, uh, to censor uh, positions with, uh, which are not mainstream. Freedom, uh, freedom of uh, uh, speech is important, but we have to take into account uh, the, the needs of this group and that group and the, 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 the sensibilities of that person and that person. Sense, so. Uh, there is already a broad consensus on that matter. Oh, don't, don't bring your ideas because you know, there is a, already a consensus. Uh, the legitimization uh, and criticism of criticism and criticism. Victimization, snowflakes and safe spaces. I, I, don't, uh, I don't want to be exposed to this idea because it's, uh, it's uh, uh, very hostile to me and uh, offensive. Uh, conspiracy theories. Oh, if you go against the mainstream, you are a conspiracy theory, a theorist. The trivialization of hate speech. A, 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 all the speech you hate, it's a hate speech. I'm afraid we need to um, close now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, I have, I have also uh, uh, another, uh, you, you know, more strategies of uh, censorship that are uh, there, uh, uh, like uh, the wrath of uh, the uncontrollable mod, cancellation and deplatforming speech, but free okay. buffer zones, obligation of conformity and pro professional rep uh, reprisals, language and, and positions, and so on. So, the last slide. Well, uh, what can religious communities do? I, I will skip the state, university, Please. religious communities. A strategy of systemic defense of speech, coordinated efforts with other religious groups, political intervention by members of the religious communities would be some of the, the ideas that uh, I would put forward. I'm, I'm sorry for taking too much of your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. For Very short with my presentation. Yeah. And now we have the pleasure of having with us uh, the Vice President uh, of uh, IRLA, the Professor Rosa Maria Martinez de Codes. Um, she is, has been the Vice President of International Religious Liberty Association, and from 1996 to 2002, she was Deputy Director of Religious Affairs at the Spanish Ministry of Justice. She is currently Professor of American History at the Complutense University of Madrid. Her areas of expertise include ethnic and religious minorities in Europe, defamation, and incitement to religious hatred. Thank you for being with us. Very, very welcome. Thank you. 
thank you so much for uh, your presentation. And uh, first of all, I should like to uh, show my appreciation for this meeting, because it's a specific, very relevant meeting, conference, I mean, because it's, uh, from my opinion and from my experience as an IRLA contributor and AIDRL contributor too, I realize that strengthening the powerful of our both networks, it's very important, both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. That is what is important, that we have two relevant networks working on religious freedom and promoting religious freedom from very close approaches. But even though we come from Europe or America, and that changes sometimes approach. But that is what is give us the strength, the strength. That is what give, will give us the power put it this way. I don't like to use power, but I will use it. Um, uh, in the future, uh, to have, a, mm, I would say, more visibility around the world, because we need that visibility. I mean, we have been working for a long, long time. When I mean long, I mean decades. And our two networks have been working for the last, in the case of IRLA, 130 years. This year we are celebrating the centenary, more than 130 years. And in, in the case of the Association of Life Funds, we have been working for more than 100 years. That means, well, that means that it takes, okay, a lot of effort, a lot, a lot of uh, research, analysis, and debate mm, uh, to promote religious freedom. And then this is one of the, this is one of the significance of this conference that we are coming together because Paulo Macedo and the team uh, did it possible to bring together all these distinguished participants in this conference. Okay, now I go with my uh, um, in engagement. Well, uh, Paolo Macedo, uh, thank you for this lovely car because I feel like uh, key piece in building the principle we defend and promote. Thank you so much, it's very warm. Well, um, mm, uh, Paolo asked me to uh, explain some of the foundations uh, con concern practice and link between freedom of religion and freedom of expression. Uh, I appreciate uh, Nasila's uh, presentation because he put the foundations of my speech. I will try to go further, a uh, step forward, okay? Then, um, when I put this, uh, um, uh, I decided to start with this slide because if you have a look to the three men on the screen, they both, they both of, I mean, both of them, two of them, and Mario Brito is in, inclusive in it, in the language, they mention human dignity, human dignity as a core issue. Human dignity, when we talk about religious freedom, and that is what, what is important, okay? When, if we go to go further with religious freedom, we have to develop human dignity and the understanding of human dignity. That's my point, in part of my language, right? Then, um, but now, uh, again, I go back to my uh, um, focus. My focus has to do with the relationship between religious freedom and uh, freedom of expression, right? I would say that fundamental to the protection of human rights are the principles of the inherent, of the inherent dignity, where are they? Yes, here. Yeah. Of the inherent dignity and equality of all human beings and the obligation of all member states of the United Nations to take measures to promote universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all, without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. It is recognized that certain forms of expression can threaten the dignity of those targeted and create an environment in which the enjoyment of equality is not possible. This is a bridge between Religious freedom, religious freedom of expression and equality. Then we have to think of that linkage. Indeed, my aim is to look at the foundations, practice and relationship between freedom of religion and freedom of expression. In recent decades, it is in, in this regard, it is relevant to consider the protection of religious speech Restrictions on anti-religious speech anti -limit and limitations on religious expression and international and, uh, in international and, nas and national instruments. 
But I'm going to look at the picture from this side. There you are. Blasphemy, religious defamation, and hate speech are issues that have frequently been on the global and regional agenda in recent years. From the infamous Danish cartoon crisis to the tragic events surrounding Charlie Hebdo in Paris, many examples demonstrate the devastating effects such behavior can have and the urgent need for legal system to address it. Terms such as blasphemy <laughs> or defamation of religions can mean different things to different people depending on the context. For this reason, three different categories should be distinguished. Well, I prefer to distinguish these three categories around freedom of religious expression in order to put some sort of guideline mm, for the future. Blasphemy, mm, I will give a very short uh, uh, mm, uh, description uh, based in the relevant literature, of course. Uh, blasphemy includes statement, statements in act or actions considered to be defamatory of God. It is explicit directed against God and is based on the assumption that God must be protected from the derogatory remarks. Defamation of religions consists of disparaging or denigrating particular religions or religion in general. It is directly against religions as abstract system of doctrine and practice. When a modern state punishes such, such defamation, it does not seek to protect God, but the religious feelings of believers or religious peace. And the third one category, incitement to religious hatred, is directed uh, against individuals who are members of a particular religion and consists uh, and consists of incitement to hatred, violence, or discrimination against people because of their religious <coughs> affiliation. What these three categories have in common is that they all involve some form of defamation of in religious matters. That is what they have in common. However, they differ in terms of against whom the statement is directed: God, a religion, or the followers of a religion. Well, let's go with plasmi, uh, blasphemy laws first. Well, for, we can think that blasphemy, blasphemy laws is not in the papers, or it's not in the agenda, we are not right. Four in 10 countries and territories around the world had blasphemy laws on the books in 2019. According to a new report from the Pew Research, from the Pew Forum on Religion and Religious Restrictions, blasphemy laws were in all five global regions covered by the analysis, including 18 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, 17 in the Asia Pacific and region, 14 in Europe, and 12 in the Americas. Well, but of course these laws are most aware, most common in the Middle East and North Africa, where 18 of the 20 countries in the region, that means 90%, had laws criminalizing blasphemy. This is pure research center, you can find it, okay, in Google. With regard to blasphemy laws, some human rights instruments suggest that such laws should be repealed. I refer to the general comment, comment number 34, article 19, concerning freedom of opinion and expression. Article 19 recognizes that reasonable restriction on freedom of expression may be necessary to prevent advocacy of hatred based on nationality, race, or religion that contributes to incitement, to discrimination, hostility, or violence. Or violence. However, the organization does not extend such legitimate restrictions to offensive and blasphemous speech. It's not in the language <coughs> of the organization. States may, but are not obliged to, introduce blasphemy legislation. Several established democracies still have blasphemy provisions on the books, although most are rarely, if even just. I remember in the United Kingdom, for example, there have been only two prosecutions for blasphemy since 1923. In Norway, the last case was in 1936, and in Denmark, 1938. Other countries, including Spain and Sweden, have repealed their blasphemy laws. 
In the United States, the Supreme Court has consistently struck down blasphemy laws, fearing that even well-meaning censors might be tempted to favor one religion over another, and because it is not the role of government to suppress real or imagined attacks on a particular religious doctrine. Lately, in Nigeria, Sufi Maslin Yahaha, Sharif Aminu, uh, was sentenced to death for blasphemy, I refer to 2020. He is currently challenging the constitutionality of the Sharia blasphemy law under which he was convicted for an allegedly blasphemous uh, audio message. In January, in January last January, the European Parliament has condemned in strong terms the enforcement of blasphemy laws and it stressed the importance of the freedom to choose one's religion. I want to quote another annual report, the 22,000 uh, report, right? Yes. On human rights and democracy in the world and what the European Union says about it. Well, religious freedom says this report from the European Union policy on the matter remains a <coughs> fundamental right that cannot be punished by death or any degrading treatment. And that is what the, uh, the report says. You have it on the screen, and I'm not going to read it. But if you put this into Kemen, I mean, there is a process on, the, on how we understand blasphemy laws. Blasphemy laws pretended to be necessary in the past, but right now we think we have another instruments, another tools to face blasphemy, right? Blasphemy laws are the antithesis of human rights. At a normative level, normative level, they establish a hierarchy of beliefs that betrays the common understanding and intention of the international human rights framework. In situations <coughs> where certain forms of expression confront religions or beliefs or members of religious or belief communities, it is essential to make a careful distinction between forms of, of expression that should constitute a criminal offense under international law, forms of expression that are not criminal but may, be, may give rise to a <coughs> civil claim, and forms of expression that do not give rise to criminal or civil sanctions but nevertheless raise concerns in terms of tolerance, civility, and respect for their religion or belief or others. From a legal perspective, each sect of facts is unique and can only be assessed and judged, whether by a judge or another impartial body, according to its own circumstances. Certain situations will undoubtedly raise an issue under international human rights law, but other situations while not raising a human rights issue, will give rise to concern in the circumstances and nature of the expression could lead to a climate of intolerance. Thus, the right to freedom of religion or belief as enshrined in relevant international legal standards does not include the right to have a religion or belief that is free from criticism or, or ridicule. Our previous, uh, our President's uh, special reporters, as Maria Hanghir mentioned it uh, many times, okay? Community, I'm sorry. Moreover, the internal obligations that may exist within a religious community in accordance with the beliefs of its member, for example, prohibition on, on, on depicting religious figures, do not in themselves constitute binding obligations or general applications and are therefore not applicable to persons who are not members of the religious group or community in question. <coughs> now let's go with defamation of religious and overview. In the area of religious defamation, uh, there is a special presentation by John Gratz concerning United Nations declaration, uh, defamation of religious. Okay, this is a sort of precedent, okay, for that one. Uh, but I wanted to mention this. In the area of religious defamation, the IRLA Board of Experts found significant divergences, which were published in Fides at Libertas 2008-2009, I mean the Journal of the International Religious Liberty Association, 
and in the context of United Nations instruments, the issue of defamation of religious first began in 1999 when the organization of the Islamic Conference, a grouping of 56 Muslim majority countries, proposed a resolution entitled Defamation of Islam. Since then, every year until 2011, the United Nations has adopted a resolution to combat defamation of religions. Well, at that time in the past, on first reading, the resolution reads as a declaration of respect and tolerance, but upon further study and legal analysis, Western states fear that it could be used to justify the misuse of blasphemy <coughs> laws. Although the United, uh, uh, the United Nations resolution was sponsored by the OIC, the concept of anti-blasphemy laws has been replicated around the world. In Russia, remember, lawsuits, lawsuits have been filed to censor television programs deemed blasphemous to Christians. In India, Hindu back anti-conversion laws criminalize threats of divine, divine uh, displeasure. In Pakistan, Article 2, 9.5 of the penal code provides for the death penalty for blasphemy against Islam, the prophet of the Quran. Given the conceptual uh, problems and the existing, and the existing of legal standards on religious discrimination, on 3rd of September 2009, the IRLA Committee of Experts issued a statement, the one on the screen, expressing concern about proposals on defamation of religions. This is in the web page, then you can check it. We agree that regulating a speech beyond existing international human rights laws, law is at best a traveling proposition that often produces results opposite, opposite to those uh, intended. That is what we said uh, a long time ago, 15 years ago, right? Well, the right to freedom of religion or belief and the right to freedom of expression are interrelated. However, the right to freedom of religion or belief does not include the right to have a religion or belief that is free from criticism. That's one of the main points at that time. And it is still one of the points. There is considerable debate, both nationally and internationally, about what types of controversial language or communication should be either permitted or prohibited? This is reflected in different levels of protection in different countries. When faced with uh, restrictions of, um, on freedom of expression in the name of religion or belief, the European Union will recall that restriction on freedom of expression may only be imposed by law are not necessary to protect the rights and reputation of others or to protect national security or public order. This is the European Union, right? Mm, well, mm, in general, Article 10 of the European Conven Convention of Human Rights prohibits the state from interfering with freedom of expression. This would, for example, prevent the government from attempting to ban forms of political or artistic expression. The prohibition is not limited to the government, but includes all public bodies such as local authorities, schools, and universities. In most cases, Article 10 does not apply to decisions taken by companies or private bodies. For example, the right to freedom of expression would not cover a newspaper's a newspaper editor's refusal to, public, uh, to publish a letter <coughs> or a decision by Facebook or Google to remove content from their websites. Hmm? With regard to restrictions on freedom of expression, the European Court of Human Rights has often described freedom of expression as one of the essential foundation of a democratic society. And here comes the point because it guarantees the right of everyone to exchange information, debate ideas, and express opinion. That is what IRA Board of Experts mentioned in, two, uh, in 28. Article 10 is not an absolute, but a qualified right, meaning that the right is of the individual must be balanced against the interest of society. <coughs> Probably if we look at this like a quality, okay? A quality right, our uh, and this approach can change. 
Whether a restriction on freedom of expression is justified is likely to depend on several factors, including the identity of the speaker, the context of the speech and its purpose, as well as the actual words spoken or written. This is case by case, what we were talking in before. Okay. Much will therefore depend on the context, such as whether the words are used at a social event in the context of, of employment in the media or when providing or receiving goods or services. This is when you come to reality, how you okay, eliminate the tension mm, and give a freedom of expression is a possibility. Mm, <coughs> at the same time, you protect mm, and respect okay, re religious expression. Well, mm, The court, in the case of uh, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, has interpreted that in every case of interference with freedom of expression, a balance must be struck between the individual's right to express himself or herself and the wider public interest justifying the interferences. Well, hate speech regulations Hate speech regulation, I'm finishing, right? Um, there is no universally accepted definition. Hate speech is generally understood to refer to expressions that incite violence, hatred, or discrimination against other individuals and groups, particularly by reference to their ethnicity, religious freedom, belief, gender, or sexual uh, orientation, language, national origin, or immigration status. In particular, Article 22, it's there. Two of the international covenant mentioned before. Okay, uh, remember us that that uh, any advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, shall be prohibited by law. Well, remember that uh, mm, the special re uh, relator Nasila mentioned that they are uh, still relevant. They are uh, still in use. I mean, the, the UN uh, instruments uh, still are valid for this sort of confronting freedom of expression. Well, probably in some cases, when you come to the case law, you realize that it needs a more subtle understanding of the tension between the two freedoms. I mean, and that means analyzing case by case. I mean, it's very difficult to put it under the same umbrella. Hmm? This tension between the two freedoms is particularly important for our communities and for our uh, people, okay, uh, to understand this. I want to mention that uh, the right to freedom of expression does not protect expression which seeks to incite violence, hatred, or discrimination against others. This is a common universal acceptance. Accordingly, uh, the European Court of Human Rights has confirmed that it may be considered necessary in certain democratic societies to sanction or even prevent all forms of expression which spread, incite, or justify hatred based on intolerance. Well, this is the Erbakan versus Turkey 2006 case law, okay? Right, yes. But, however, in the contents of apparently intolerant speech, a balance again must be struck between the right of individuals to express views that others may find offensive or insulting, and the rights of others to be protected from hatred and uh, discrimination. And now to put an end to this, uh, mm, something that I want to mention is that hate speech is particularly hurt hurtful to victims because they are targeted solely because they are their personal identity, their actual or perceived racial or ethnic origin, or their actual or perceived faith or belief. The confusion, fear, and lack of security felt by individuals has a ripple effect on their wider community of their racial and religious group. And communities can feel victimized and, vul and are vulnerable to further attacks. Well, what I mean is that if you take as a summary these three categories, I would say that 
hate speech legislation may be a legitimate, a potentially necessary restriction on freedom of expression. They ca but they cannot be the only or even the central response to prejudice, racism, and discrimination. We need more tools, of course. The appropriate response to hate speech is not simply more speech, but policies and actions that address the root causes of inequality in all its forms and colors. Hate speech restrictions on freedom of expression should be carefully designed to promote equality and protect against discrimination unlike all such restrictions should meet the three-part test set out in Article 19 of the International Covenant. I mean, it's provided for by law, it's pursued as legitimate aim, and it's necessary in a democratic society. Well, mm, all this in conclusion, it is clear that the European legal instruments for the protection of human rights namely the European Court and previously the European Commission, have developed a significant, significant methods for determining whether interference with freedom of expression can be justified or constitutes a violation of human rights. Well, this is another instrument that has to give us a better understanding of the tension between the two freedoms and how to solve the problems that come out of them. Thank you. Molto obrigado. I'm not completely sure about the purpose of my speech. Uh, I think they have picked people of common sense and they wanted to test whether common people could understand anything about what was said in the last almost two hours. So as I was listening to the three excellent, thought-provoking and value-asserting presentations, it has become clear to me that all of us and, and for all of us, the concept of free speech, uh, freedom of religion and belief is very precious. As I look back to the presentations, I learned from Professor uh, Ghanea that it takes time to change mindsets and ingrained mentalities. The allegations, even if we call them communications, they are not followed through by governments who seem to interpret human rights from their own perspective of religious or political hegemony. I learned from Professor Machado that societies are so ideologically divided that not even a common external enemy can help to unite them. Integration, concordance, harmonizing conflicts of rights, that are in a dialectical tensions are concepts that I'm still <coughs> grappling with. Dangers of disinformation, resonance chambers, social media bubbles that are forming around us are challenges that we have to face. And that there is more and more ideological polarization that leads to sectarianism and violence. <coughs> then Professor Martinez showed us this concepts of blasphemy, defamation, and incitement to religious hatred are on a daily basis dealt with uh, at the forums that were mentioned. All this led to an understanding of mine, and it occurred to me that with all the emphasis that we put on the freedom of expression, all our speeches, all our discourses and narratives come to nothing if there's nobody to listen. And this is my final common sense conclusion that I draw from all the three papers, that we might put a very precious emphasis on the freedom of speech, 
that values almost nothing if we do not teach people how to listen. And I would suggest that if we do not learn ourselves and do not teach people how to listen, our political or religious discourses will be nothing else than deaf people talking to one another. And therefore, I would like to suggest that we need to learn how to listen first with our ears. And I would say in brackets, with our minds. Listening comes more natural to some than to others. But we all know that without listening, there is no real relationship between two human beings. We sometimes think that what makes us humans special in the world is our ability to express concepts in words. And we neglect to admit that listening is almost as important as the ability to express something eloquently. The Bible says that we need to be quick to listen and slow to speak. I don't know how that comes into this picture of freedom of speech, but we need to learn to listen. Listen with our ears, with our minds. And I think that our willingness to listen will be one of the deepest signs that we really appreciate the freedom of others to speak, to express their beliefs, and to live their values. Number two, I would say we have to learn how to listen with our hearts, which is basically empathy. We need to come to be able to listen not only to what is said, but what is felt in order to really understand the others. And I just quote Brene Brown, who says that empathy is a way to connect to the emotion of others. Are we willing to listen, not only mentally, but also emotionally? Because sometimes all these expressions, and we sp spoke a lot about hate speech, is not only about facts. And as Professor Machado said, there's a lot of disinformation that comes from an emotional background, from a lot of insecurity. And if we are not able to listen not only to the facts that have, that have been said or not, but to the emotions that generate that discourse, we are not really listening. And number three, I would say that we need to learn how to listen self-reflectively, which means a willingness to change. Self-reflection, according to a recent book that was published by Todd Bolsinger that is titled Tempered Resilience, is the ability, he says, of leaders to lead in a constantly changing and chaotic world. How? By listening and then reflecting about our own position and with an openness to change if we have to change. So that's my takeaway. Yes, we need to uphold everybody's freedom of speech, of belief, religion, and expression. But as a parallel track to that, we need to learn and to teach others to listen. To listen intellectually with our minds, to listen emotionally with empathy, and to listen self-reflectively with an openness to change. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Loja, for leading this panel. Thank you for all the speakers. Thank you for the, the last remarks, uh, Dr. Barner, too. I invite you now to finish our first session and to go immediately to our um, lunch. It is going to be served in the same uh, place where we had the, the coffee break. We will be back at uh, 2.25. The gong will, will, uh, will sign the moment to come. We'll start at 2.30, OK? Thank you so much. <laughs>